You're going to advance those, Nicolette? Okay. So kind of an old uh, health education adage, but one that I think fits very well in this whole issue of engagement is that if we're really trying to reach people and bring them along in community building, we need to do what this proverb says, which is basically go in search of people, begin with what they know, and build on what they have. And that's exactly what we're trying to do in our coalition work. Next. When we think about coalitions, there are a lot of functions that they have. And I just wanted to, to basically, I know this is a review for many of you, but just to put us in the mode of thinking about how coalitions work. And so these are the, the key tasks, as it were, that I would think a coalition needs to engage in. First is to analyze what the community's issue is to assess what their assets are, as well as the needs that may come up, develop an action plan, figure out what are the best, either proven or promising strategies out there to help uh, work on a solution for the needs that the community has uh, exhibited, and then really work toward reaching those community level outcomes. And in doing that, you should begin to see some of the social change that uh, we formed these groups for in the first place. Next. So why are we building coalitions? Next, please. Some of the benefits to think about. First of all, we know that coalitions maximize the influence of individuals and organizations. So uh, here you see the fish bringing along a whole cohort of his. We know that it's not just one individual at the table represented, but that individual represents an organization, and that organization represents a whole lot of other individuals. So you're really uh, exponentializing the power that you have in communities. Next. The second thing we know that coalitions do is they create new uh, collective resources. So we hope that our partners, by joining with us, are beginning to think what can they contribute to this effort and how can we work together in a way that's going to be of benefit to both the coalition and to the individual organizations that are part of it. And then thirdly, next please, we know that coalitions reduce duplication of efforts. So we need to take a look at what's going on in the community already and how can the work that we're doing in coalitions really build on that and also bring something new to the table. The, the other thing I'd like to mention as far as coalitions go, next please, is to think about the stage that your coalition might be at because that's going to make a big difference on the kind of recruitment and engagement procedures that you need to spend your time on. Next please. So we think about the stages of coalition development, and we think about a coalition growing, just like this little seed. Next, please. And I want you to take, I want to just take you briefly through what should happen doing, during those four basic stages. So during formation is when we're re building the organization, we're beginning to pull our staff people together, recruit those members, and from the members draw on the leadership that we set up. Secondly, during implementation is when we begin to get a little more uh, solidified. We start to set up our operating procedures, the rules, figure out what roles people are going to play. That's when we really get deep into assessing the community and getting involved in our planning and implementation phases, putting those strategies in place. In the maintenance phase, that's when we're engaging our members finally to commit their time, talent, and resources to implement those strategies and to sustain the coalition over time. And then the last stage, institutionalization or sustainability, is when we really start to see those um, first early outcomes, those community outcomes, and then the longer term outcomes. So we use the term institutionalization. I think all of us really understand this as sustainability. So what I wanted to mention here was when we think about engaging community members and really getting them to, to work well together. Some of this work will be done uh, initially during formation, but a lot of what we're talking about really happens in this maintenance phase here. And I also, the next slide please, wanted to just bring up very briefly uh, the Community Coalition Action Theory that Michelle Kegler and I developed uh, back in 2001 and then revised again in, in 2009. And the reason I want to mention this is not to give you the dizzying play-by-play -play of how this theory and this framework plays out, but I want you to think through 
as we move from left to right across this, um, this graphic here, we start to really build the coalition itself. So we know that we talked now in this yellow bar at the bottom that coalitions form in stages that are iterative over time. We know that in this upper box, the context that the community's in, um, that the context that the coalition is in, excuse me, uh, in the community, it lives in the community, and so it's going to be shaped by that community. And then as we move across, we start this process of convening the group, beginning to put these structures together during formation, and then through to maintenance and, and institutionalization, as I mentioned. But you can see here our big pieces when we're talking about recruitment would happen right here at the very beginning, this first orange uh, block with the arrow. And then it becomes very, very important when we start to think about how our members pull together their resources and start to work collaboratively together and develop a synergy that allows them to move from this um, engagement stage into actually doing some planning implementation and then moving on to those uh, longer term outcomes. So let's talk a little bit about uh, community engagement and coalitions now. If we can move to the next slide and the next one. Uh, what, what does that really mean? So I'm giving you a definition on the next slide from the CDC. It's kind of a wordy one, but I, I found it as I begin to, began to start researching what does this term really mean? It's being used a lot over and over and means different things to different people. So I went back um, to a publication that CDC created in 1997 called The Principles of Community Engagement. And here's what they said community engagement was. It's working collaborative, collaboratively with and through groups of people who are affiliated by either geographic proximity, special interests, or similar situations to address issues affecting their well-being. So if we go to the next slide, what do, what do we really mean by that? It's a lot of wordiness. What does that really mean? Well, to me, it means focusing on a community's expectations, their assets, and their needs when you design, implement, and evaluate some of these solutions that you come up with collaboratively with community members. It means valuing community members as equal partners. And that's easy to say, not so easy to do. And then it means melding community wisdom, that wisdom gained from experience, the lived experience of that community itself with the institutional and scientific ex expertise that your academic centers, your health departments, your health care providers might be bringing to the table. So it's both of those sets of wisdom that is really going to get you to your final goal. So let's move on a little bit here. The next slide, just I want you to, all I really want to say from this one is when we think about community engagement, it's really grounded in principles that we learned long ago in the whole um, world of community organization. So it's, it's centered around values like fairness, justice, self-determination, participation, empowerment, a lot of these terms, again, that are pretty charged, pretty emotion charged, and we use them um, kind of lightly sometimes. But I, I just want you to remember that as you think about engagement, all of these principles are really a part of that work. Uh, there is a publication in the next slide, and again, I want to mention this one to you, again from the CDC, um, called um, Ready, Set, Goal, uh, the Goals of Community Engagement. And this was uh, published in 2011. I found it really helpful to read, um, even though I've been teaching about community engagement for a long time. And so what, what they said, the three goals, the three essential goals of engaging the community were these three. And we can go pretty rapidly through these slides. So if you next, please. So the three goals are to build trust. Secondly, next slide, to enlist new resources and allies. And then thirdly, to create better communication. So that's what we're trying to do when we engage the community. And if we look at the next slide, the benefits of community engagement, what are they? Well, it's some of the same benefits that we hope uh, coalitions would have, right? There's going to be strengthened communities. There's going to be better cohesiveness, strengthened accountability, uh, both of the partners and coalition to coalition, improved service delivery, efficiency and effectiveness, we would hope, and finally, improved health and social outcomes. On the next slide, you'll see um, what's called the Community Engagement Continuum. 
And I've actually simplified this quite a bit. There's one that's a, a little bit more complex if you take a look at it, but I, I like this one. And basically it says, when you're, when you're beginning to engage people in the work, you start by reaching out. Uh, you hope to move to a more consultative role. Then you begin to involve people in the working of this coalition or organization. They begin to see the value of collaborating, so they start to do that. And then really you're getting to the point where leadership is shared among all your members. So as you move from left to right, from outreach to shared leadership, along the way you hope you're going to have uh, increased levels of trust, increased community involvement, better communication, and certainly a fuller impact. So those three goals of community engagement come out here. And then on the next slide you'll see the, uh, some of the realities of both working in coalition and engaging communities. By the way, this work comes um, from the, the uh, International Association for Public Participation. So some of the realities we know about engaging the community and working in coalition is that each member must believe that it needs help to reach their goals. So a sense that each organization understands it's part of a greater whole. Secondly, there has to be common ground uh, that, so that people at least agree on some of the basic purposes and strategies that they might engage in in this work. We know, thirdly, that continuous negotiation has to happen. Uh, it doesn't happen just once. There's, there's constantly a need to check back, to feed back, to make sure we're on the right track. And then finally, to finally, to fairly share power and benefits, every single partner has to believe that even though they know there are costs, there's going to be more benefits in participating collaboratively than there would be um, by working alone, and that, in fact, it's going to be worth their effort. It's going to match or exceed the contributions or the things that they put into the work. And then the next, I want to talk about engaging the community now in coalitions, so taking it to the next step. And the next slide, please. So as we're engaging the community and coalitions, there's certain things that are pretty commonsensical, yet we often forget about them. The first is that you really have to begin to know your community. You have to start to take a look at what does it look like? What, what, are, the thing, what are the assets that it has in its favor? What do the neighborhoods look like? What are some of the issues that people are facing? And to really learn those things, you can't do as these folks are doing and just sit pouring over maps and zip codes and um, data from the health department or from the social service department or from the census. Uh, secondly, next slide please, you have to get out there. You have to go into the community and start talking to people, just as the, the woman in this slide is doing. You know, what's it like living here? What's it like being a parent in this community? How hard is it, how hard is it for you to access health care? How hard is it for you to pay for your health care? What are the barriers of transportation in this community? And on and on and on. But to begin to have some of those conversations, not just with agencies uh, and with organizations who might be partners of yours eventually, but to really get out and talk to the people that you're trying to serve, that priority population. Next, please. You also have to be careful and, and open to to understanding the diversity in, the, in each community. And it's going to be different in each community. But there's not only understanding that there's diverse organizations, diverse uh, qualities of the community in every aspect you can imagine. So I think this, this shot, slide shows a little bit about you know, ethnic age, um, sexual orientation perhaps, um, gender equality, on and on and on. We need to really think about the community and the richness of its broad diversity and not only recognize it and try to understand it, but to be respectful, I think is, is a key term here. And then the next piece, if we're really going to be true to, to engaging folks, is to identify the people and the organizations that you want to engage in the work. So sitting down and very intentionally thinking through, who would it make sense to invite? You know, why, why do we want them here? Next, please. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this now in the next few slides. So in thinking about the potential organizations, just like those folks sitting there at the table, you know, you may begin to think, who has previously supported this issue in the past? Uh, that might be an organization or an individual that you want to, to uh, recruit. 
uh, which organizations in the community have goals that are compatible with your coalition's goals. Do you have past relationships, positive or negative? Um, are there a specific cultural elements that you need to think through or values that are different that may affect how you work together? And then really what do they bring to the table? What is it that they have that you need? And I'll go into this a little bit more. And finally, what, what do they publicly stand for out there? So one way I do this is, is just to think about it in a, in a list kind of way. Next, please. And to start con constructing some tables that would help you think through these questions. So the first table might say, what organizations need to be involved in this coalition? So to, to literally go down the list, look to your chamber of commerce, look to your, um, your uh, social organizations and community, your list of voluntary agencies perhaps that are put out by the chamber or put out by uh, the mayor's office or your city government. And then to think through, um, okay, we, we think we want this organization. They, their name comes up a lot. But why? What's, what's valuable? What do they have to offer? And what role might they play in our coalition? So it's a, if it's an organization that um, is technologically very savvy, for example, then part of the role they might play is to help you um, really uh, begin to, to pull your, your uh, social media together, your websites together, pull together perhaps some strategic plans or some budgeting. So what are the things they have to offer you? Next, please. Thinking through now, um, again, this community inventory, uh, what, are, what are some of the initiatives that, that these potential organizations, we're back to them again, what, what, are, what the initiatives are they involved in? What are they doing? Uh, that's visible out there in the community? Are they focusing on some outcomes, perhaps like um, healthy eating, active living kind of outcomes, or improving immunizations, or reducing domestic violence that are very similar to yours? And then, you know, how can you get in contact with them? Maybe you have a contact within your own coalition that you could use to approach them and begin to bring them to this work. Um, next, you want to overcome and really identify any barriers that might be in the way of people being involved in the coalition. So what might stand in the way of them joining you? Um, is there a sense of competition? Is there a sense that your organization isn't responsive to the population they're serving? What things might keep you uh, from working together well? Next, please. We want to engage members from all relevant community sectors. So I sort of give you this color wheel here that has you know, just a sample of the kind of sectors that you might draw on. So everyone from the uh, media, from service organizations, from social services, from law enforcement, from business. What I ask folks to do is to sit down and think, who are the sectors of the community that it would make most sense for you to engage? And then not only that, but are there specific skills that you might need that could be addressed by these organizations, but there might be some other individuals or organizations that you hadn't previously thought of, or perhaps there are folks within some of your uh, partner organizations already that have some specific skills, say, in uh, communication or in marketing that you don't currently have at the table. So beginning to think sector-wide. Uh, there's an activity, if you go on my website, and I should mention that is coalitionswork.com. If you go on that website, there's a, a tool there called the Recruitment Roundup. And it basically will take you through the steps of how you could identify the sectors and then um, get to the part, point of actually recruiting folks. And it gives you a very simple way to do that that people tell me is really very helpful. So then how, what strategies are you going to use then to actually recruit? Next, please. I think a lot of us tend to use uh, the tried and true email or leaving a phone message. Uh, and oftentimes I'll hear from coalition partners who will say, you know, I've invited um, the Baptist Ministers Association, for example, and I've sent an email. In fact, I've sent two and a follow-up third email and I still haven't heard from them, so I guess they're really just not interested. Or I've left a phone message with their secretary with this. I think at some point you need to get to the face-to-face -face meeting part. Um, and I think there's nothing that is a substitute 
for getting to that person's place of employment, um, pressing the flesh, talking to them, looking in the eye, talking about what uh, they can provide for your coalition that you need and what your organization, uh, the coalition, can provide for them. Uh, so I, I'm a big believer that at some point you need to get out of your office and, and have some face-to-face -face meetings um, in the, on their own turf. Another way to recruit is to connect with other organizations in your coalition and help connect with, with uh, other groups that they work with, so kind of a, a double-tier recruitment process. Sometimes you might be able to do a recruitment contact when you're out doing some other work in the community, like a community assessment, like a community inventory, like a SWOT analysis. Um, you might meet some folks, or perhaps you're doing a community survey or focus groups, and you connect with people through those research processes that then say, hey, you know, this work sounds pretty interesting that you're doing. Well, we'd love to have you. You know, would you consider coming as a member uh, of our coalition? And then there are opportunities when we offer trainings or events in the community. Perhaps we're doing, you know, a health fair or a, a community training. This would be another time to say, we really could use your input. We could use your involvement in our coalition. Next, please. There's one other tool that is on the website explained very well, but it's this buddy system of member recruitment that I think works very well and has worked well for a lot of coalitions that I've worked with. And that is to every time you're beginning, and I've given you sort of the, the, uh, the quick and dirty <laughs> steps here, but really asking every time you put a new strategy out there that you're going to, to propose that you'd like to try, to think who isn't at this table right now that could help us do this work. And then it really to, to ask your members, is there anyone who could help connect to this organization that we've identified? And if so, would, would you be willing to be their buddy to actually start the contact process? So in step number three, the buddy would contact the member, encourage them to join, answer any questions, and say, you know, our, our coordinator, our coalition coordinator, will be following up with you. Step four, the coalition coordinator does follow up, sends them an orientation packet or a virtual uh, link to your website that has, um, you know, a, a set of slides or new member information. And then in the next step, to be able to say for this buddy, hey, I just got my meeting notice, this should trigger me to call that person that I recruited and make sure they're going to show up to the next meeting. So encouraging them to attend. And then once they hopefully do show up at the meeting, to be there to acclimate them to the environment and introduce them to other folks in the coalition. So that's the buddy system of recruitment. And again, it means that when that person actually is at the end of that meeting, they have a very good foundation for what the coalition is and what role they might play in that group. Another thing that's helpful, next slide please, is having a, a commitment card, an annual commitment card that each organization is asked to sign. Now this is a very simple one. We use this in some of the, um, the, the REACH coalitions, the ASSIST coalitions, the ACHIEVE coalitions. But to, to understand that there's something expected of you as a coalition member. And that would be in terms of your, your time, treasure, talent, right? So what resources could you contribute uh, to the coalition. It could be an in-kind resource like meeting space. It could be cold hard cash. It could be some hours that your volunteers could donate to the effort. Um, but there's a sense of, yes, I'm in this. I'm committing our organization, not me, Fran Butterfuss, but my organization, Coalition's Work, um, to this effort. Sometimes the letters are more than just a commitment card. There's an actual uh, commitment letter that outlines things a little more detailed way, but you'll just have to decide for your community which would be the most acceptable method. And I do have samples of, of both those, again, on the website. So I want you to think about in the next slide, what is really the role of the coalition member? And I think oftentimes our members think perhaps their job is to come to meetings, <laughs> to come to meetings and events. And what we hope is they're doing more than doing that that they see themselves as instrumental in this work. So we expect that they're going to help us not only develop, but really get the vision and mission out there to the rest of the community. In effect, they might be in a, seen as an ambassador for the coalition, so that when they're at a meeting uh, for a different purpose, they could literally introduce themselves, 
that um, I'm Mary Smith, and I'm, I'm representing the, um, the food pantry in our community, but also I'm a proud member of the Healthy Yorktown uh, Coalition. So you're really putting the word out there and being proud about the fact that you have this role in this, in this coalition. I think every member should see their job as recruitment, as helping secure resources for the coalition, certainly being participative, providing guidance, providing feedback, and helping to implement those strategies that are going to change policy systems and environments, those PSE change strategies. I like this uh, quote. It actually comes from um, Building Communities from the Inside Out from Kretzmann and McKnight. It's an old publication, but I, but I love what they said here, so if you'll bear with me. They said, every single person has capabilities, abilities, and gifts. Living a good life depends on whether those capabilities can be used, abilities expressed, and gifts given. If they are, the person will be valued, feel powerful, and be well-connected to people. And the community around that person will be more powerful because of the contribution that person is making. So again, this valuing of individuals and this expectation that they're not only contributing by themselves, they're representing an organization, they're representing a community. Uh, very powerful statement. So why do members join a coalition? You know, why do, why do they stay with us? Uh, just like this lineup of babies that look pretty eager, uh, they probably believe in the issue that you're focusing on. Hopefully they believe in your mission. They're there to build relationships. They want to accomplish something. They want to have an impact. Um, they wanted to see that their time was well spent. And perhaps they just want to feel up to date and informed and, and part of a movement. And sometimes that's it too. And on the flip side, why do people leave? And uh, on the next slide, you'll see a picture of a baby. Um, to me, they're kind of a, it's kind of a crybaby or a bored baby. <laughs> this baby just says, hey, I, you know, I'm done here. I don't feel included. I'm not necessarily agreeing with what's going on in this coalition. I'm not sure even why I'm here. I don't know what my job is. And I don't see anything happening as a result of my involvement. So oftentimes members will leave. They won't tell you they're going to leave. They just stop coming. They stop showing up. And you don't want that to happen. You want it to be that lineup of expectant babies that I showed you on the previous slide. So how do we make sure that this happens? What, what do we really have to do? Next, please a whole set of activities in my mind. We have to first engage people in things that matter to them, which means we would have had to do some talking. We would have had to do some sharing. We would have had to do some discussing about what is really important. Uh, is it the fact that people are getting enough to eat, or is it more than that? Is that they're eating healthy, that they're, they're able to have their bodies nourished and able to do the work that they were intended to do? Next, please. We need to provide opportunities for people to share their knowledge, to share their experience, to share goals and energy. Look at this excited group of young people. They are ready to go. They are ready to move forward. And that's how we'd like to see our coalition members responding, wouldn't we? That they're there to get going and get something done. Next, please. We need to make sure that we gather uh, and use community data so that we can agree on not only the purpose of our work, but what kinds of activities would make sense? Um, how, how feasible are these activities? How much um, intensity do we have to implement in the community? What's our timeline? And you see here people creating a storyboard um, to start that process of asking those questions. What is it we're here for? What is it we're supposed to do? But it's informed. Um, next, we want to bring people to the table. And we want to make sure that they're actively involved in decision making, actively involved. They're just not there to be a feedback, you know, to, to complete a feedback circuit. They're there to, to make some pretty heavy decisions about things that are important to them. And when that happens, it's very, very powerful, extremely powerful. So we know that if we can do those things and we can develop a uh, member's commitment to, to plan um, to and their capacity to take action, then they're going to stay with us for a while. We know, in fact, next slide please, that retention is going to be a whole lot more likely um, when people feel valued. Sorry, this is a little different than I have here. Okay, I'll move with it. 
uh, we need to identify and mobilize member assets and resources. So what, what are they bringing to the table that we can pull together and use and, and really get the most out of? And you'll see people are actively planning and trying to put some um, educational opportunities in place is what they're doing here. Next, please. So once we're doing all those things, we know that retention is going to be more likely. We know that mission and value step because we've talked to folks. We know that um, the organizations that people are members of are getting the credit they need, that there's easy access to information, that people feel fulfilled, and an expectation that they don't have to be super active volunteers all the time, that we need to allow them to have a little flexibility in how they contribute. We need to provide orientation training, not only at the beginning when we're forming a coalition, because I think we do a good job of that, but to continue to provide um, experiences and opportunities for continued learning, creating a learning community. Uh, we certainly want experienced members to mentor uh, the new members. Now the host of the event, it says, okay. Um, so we want them to continue to move forward. Okay, actually I have control now. This is really nice. All right, thank you. Uh, we need to motivate our members. And so how do we do that? What do we provide as, as tools for them? Um, again, I think training is a key thing and learning some very specific skills, some collaborative skills that they can take not only to their working groups within the coalition, but that they can actually um, use in, in their work life. I'm not sure why this is switching back and forth, folks. Sorry about that. Um, offering annual leadership retreat, for example, is something that is a, a key value to people in the coalition. Uh, offering transportation to go to some of these meetings that might not be local, especially if you're really trying to engage your priority population. Giving leaders an opportunity to represent the coalition in the media, at grantee meetings, uh, at national meetings, this is a real opportunity that they might not have other than for the coalition. Or perhaps they were just being asked to provide some letters of recommendation, uh, some uh, recommendations for a new job, recommendations for further schooling. So a lot of ways that we can actually uh, motivate people to want to continue. Some retention tips again, using the buddy system as I mentioned before. There are coalitions that actually provide stipends to members um, and, and they're given uh, money perhaps for uh, transportation or uh, just a small stipend to encourage their membership. Um, making attendance easy in every way. So you know, making sure there are good directions, there's babysitting provided if needed, that the meeting is in a convenient place and time. And that the meetings are fun. You know, I think we often forget about uh, making the work fun. So one more quote that I want to give to you here, uh, it comes from the Borg Warner Company, but I, I like the way they, they mentioned this here. So they said, however large or complex an organization may be, its work is still done by people. Each person involved is a unique human being with pride, needs, values, and innate personal worth. To succeed, we must operate in a climate of openness and trust in which each of us freely grants others the same respect, cooperation, and decency we seek for ourselves. So and part of this motivation issue is really providing that, that sense of we're in this together and we respect each and every person in this coalition. I want to leave with one other activity that I think would be very helpful as you begin to, to work on um, recruiting members, and it's an activity called the six R's of participation. Again, not a new one, but one that I find works uh, every single time I've ever tried it. So uh, this comes from Kay and Wolf, and it's it basically thinking of these six R's that make participation work. So the six R's are recognition, respect, role, relationship, reward, and results. And I'm going to go through each of these. The idea is you basically provide a little training on what the six R's are, and then you ask people to break into groups. Each group focuses on one of these key R's, and you ask very, two very simple questions. What are we doing now in this coalition to promote respect among individuals? And the second question is, 
what could we be doing in the future? And then we, you, once the groups have met and come up with their list of especially what could they do in the future, um, then we put those on the board. And these become ideas that could be implemented to really help motivate and secure the membership. So let's, let's start with the first star here, which is respect. And we know that everybody wants respect. And by joining a volunteer effort like a coalition, um, we're seeking respect from our peers. People often find that their values, culture, or traditions aren't respected in the workplace or the community. But we certainly want to make sure th that this idea of respect is built in our coalitions. So what can we do to build respect for each other in our coalitions would be the question that you would ask at the, in those small group uh, settings. Secondly, recognition. We know that people want to be recognized for leadership. We all want to be recognized by members of our own group, by members of other groups for our efforts to build healthy states, healthy communities, um, you know, crime-free communities, whatever the issue is that you're focusing on. So how can we recognize each other's contributions uh, to our coalition's efforts? So being highlighted in our newsletter, being able to get up in, in a meeting and talk about some um, activity that your organization is being uh, is working on that you maybe would like some assistance from the coalition on would be an example. This idea of role, we mentioned this before, we all want to feel needed, right? We want to belong to a group that gives us a prominent role and where our contributions are appreciated. And we need to think, how can we develop meaningful roles for our coalition members? What is that, what, how does that play out? Relationships, um, oops, excuse me. Relationships, coalitions are organized networks. So how do we provide networking opportunities, for example, or learning opportunities for our coalition members? That's certainly something that, that people are looking for. So even uh, providing a time before and after meetings, for example, uh, where there's maybe some refreshments, some time for people to connect, maybe having a time at the end of the meeting where each person or each organization is able um, to uh, offer something to the coalition. Um, either a comment or to advertise something that's going on in their own coalition, their own organization. Uh, rewards, certainly. Uh, we talked about the rewards and membership outweighing the cost. So we need to figure out what are the rewards um, which respond to members' self-interest. So how can we reward coalition members for their efforts on the coalition's behalf? And then finally, results is key. Nothing works like results. We know that. And uh, what how do we let our members know what's going on with the coalition and what's working, what isn't working, uh, so that they can tout these kinds of uh, good successes to their own organization. So the six R's, I think it's a great tool, a great discussion starter for getting us to think through what is it that it takes to keep people engaged in the work. And then I want to just mention a couple other things here as part of the work. Um, if, we're, if we're trying to make sure that people are engaged, we need to create plans of work that are viable, that are economical, that people understand and they accept. So action plans and then finally strategic plans that are very carefully orchestrated and, and that everyone feels they have a stake. So people will help to uh, support what they create, right? Uh, we want to make sure that we foster and implement strategies that change policy systems and environments. We want to do that. We want to make sure that everybody um, has a sense that we're working on the big things, the hard things, the, the long-range things. We want to monitor and evaluate and communicate our outcomes, as we mentioned before, it's something that's, that's very valuable for people to know about, and keeps them wanting to work with you, keeps them wanting to keep coming and keep working. And then finally, we know we need to prepare to release control of the coalition and its strategies at some point. Um, and maybe we just, as we test out new strategies, we may find that, yes, this one was a good idea, but it is a very costly. It's more like an experimental program. And this is something the coalition isn't going to be able to sustain over time. So we can just release this strategy to one of our partners. We, we know how to do it now. And we can help them, uh, help their organization take the lead in doing that. So I, I leave you with the thought that community coalition we know is a long-term commitment. Um, these organizations are working on complex problems. They're not going to be solved overnight. And it's going to require the commitment of people 
over a long stretch of time to make change happen. So uh, again, sorry for the technical difficulties. I hope um, you were able to um, get what you hoped for in this uh, presentation. And I, I guess there's a couple minutes we can do questions, but certainly uh, any time you can um, contact me directly and I'd be glad to speak with you by phone or by email. Um, my email is pretty simple. It's long, but it's easy. It's fran.butterfoss at coalitionswork.com. So fran.butterfoss at coalitionswork, which is a sentence, right? Coalitionswork.com. Um, if you want to call me, my number is 757-898-7454. Seven five seven eight nine eight seven four five four, and I don't mind if Sophie um, certainly releases that information with this webinar. And that's all I have. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Fran Butterfoss, for your wonderful presentation. Again, we do apologize for the technical difficulties that we experienced during this webinar. Um, again, this webinar was recorded, and it will be available. Um, for later review. So on behalf of the, um, Sophie, we want to thank our presenter and all of our participants today for participating in today's webinar. If you have any questions, this is the time. We have a few minutes, which is very tight, um, but we will allow some time for questions. And of course, you can always email us if you have any um, particular questions that you would like um, answered from our speaker. Um. I was also going to say, Nicolette, perhaps um, we do have a follow-up call, right? Yes, we do. That we're going to be doing and maybe giving the information of that again? Yes, we can do that. That's going to be next, this, hmm, I think it's this Wednesday. No, the 29th. The 29th. 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 Sorry, October the 29th. It's going to be the 29th. Um, that will be a wonderful opportunity for you to have a chance to look at the materials that was provided. Um, when you register for this webinar today, the handouts were provided. Um, you can access that. That was added to this uh, registration so you would have that. And on October 29th, we will be, have an opportunity to ask any additional questions that you have. Will the phone number, will the call-in number be the same or the, the meeting number? It will be different. It will be okay. different. So you'll different send that out in advance? Yes, they ha everybody has to register in order to be able to participate. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, I don't see any questions at this time. Um, so we will begin on the 29th. Thanks for joining us. Um, and please be sure to fill out the uh, feedback form. Thank you so much. This Thanks. Bye. Today's webinar.